trying to tackle attendance issues, when you're trying to tackle like students not being engaged in schoolwork, right? A lot of those are deeply connected to larger needs. And so if the school does not tackle the root of the problem or the root of the issue that might be keeping the child from learning, then we're gonna continue to have students dropping out, missing school, not passing their classes. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? It's Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher here in the Los Angeles area. This is year 19 in the classroom for me. And this year, of course, is all of the above. You're home for news and analysis of all matters pertaining to our world of education. We wanna welcome everybody who's joining us for perhaps the second time because our last episode with Mimi Eisen of the Zen Education Project um, really got into a lot of folks' feeds who we're new to all of the above. So shout out to the Zen Education Project for boosting that conversation about reconstruction and history standards and, and how we go about teaching a truthful history. And if you are new to all of the above, do know that we love and appreciate you being here. And we hope you appreciate today's episode, which is for sure gonna be a super dope one. Please remember to like and subscribe and hit us with those five stars and all that good stuff. Jeff, we are here now. November, November, we got midterm elections around the corner. We got Wakanda forever around the corner. We have the World Cup starting. We got, you know, Thanksgiving week and all that good stuff. Jeff, what's, what are you looking forward to this November? Uh, first of all, the thing I'm looking forward to out of that list by far the most is Wakanda forever, okay? Yeah. Look. Wakanda forever. Uh, <laughs> it's about to feed my soul, man. Much more so than these trash midterm elections. Uh, okay, S separate point. Um, you know, I, I, man, well, I feel like November is always uh, an interesting time in the school year because, you know, we're past that initial point, which is like October where the honeymoon ends. You, you start getting like a little more deeper into the groove. The stakes are raised a little bit in terms of first semester grades, but like there's still time to recover some things. So, you know, the college applications, you know, the early decision apps are starting to go out and the essays are getting polished up. Like it's November is an exciting time, I think. Uh, that is true. School. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here for it, man. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm particularly interested in what this World Cup is going to be like during the school year because it's unprecedented for the World Cup to be in wintertime and there's a whole lot of corrupt reasons why it's in the winter this time around. And I just mm. remember way back in the day when it was the South Africa World Cup and I remember there was a game, uh, Mexico v uh, versus South Africa, and our school was basically empty because everyone stayed home <laughs> to watch that match. So I'm curious what uh, impact it might have on attendance uh, this time around. So. We'll see. Yeah, I, we'll see. I kind of, I kind of love it, man. You, you just made me flash back to when we were doing our student teaching, and I think, I think that was the year, if I remember correctly, it was like the first Super Bowl that the Patriots won when they, when they went on their, you know, dynasty. It was uh, their second. I remember. Oh, it was the quite second. Clearly, okay. Okay. But it was yeah. Okay, but it was early enough in the run where like that they had their um, parade on like you know Tuesday at noon or whatever whatever right. it was a school day at noon and the kids were like so listen here mister like you know i like you and all but <laughs> at 11 a.m. i'm not going to be here anymore <laughs> yeah and i'm like you know i kind of respect it man enjoy the enjoy the world cup kids enjoy the parade <laughs> yeah for sure for yeah. sure and um, and actually i i do want to remind folks whoever might be watching us on youtube it's come to my realization that if you only watch us on YouTube and we're not super active on our YouTube channel, you might not realize that in between these video episodes, we do drop a passing period episode strictly on the podcast streaming apps. And just like a real passing period in the school building, it's a time for Jeff and I just to catch up and, and talk about uh, perhaps news that didn't make it into our full episode. So if you are only familiar with us through YouTube, definitely, definitely head over to your podcast app, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever you use, find us there and subscribe so that you don't miss those episodes which drop in between our full episodes. All right, so Jeff, full episode today. That means there must be a super dope guest in the building. I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm feeling like we're back to these full episodes, these video episodes. I think it would be wonderful to go ahead and go all out and do like a, a double super dope guest mm. situation. Mm. Something like that. I don't know if we could squeeze that all in there, Jeff, but why don't you go ahead and tell us what's on today's agenda? 
Well, you are in luck, uh, Dr. Rustin, because today, not only do we have one amazing dope guest, we got two. Uh, and not okay. only has- Double dope, double dope. It, exactly. And not only has one of our dope guests previously been a guest on the show, but both have. We have uh, two amazing educators, Manuel, come to join us both. Uh, doing fantastic work at uh, Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School uh, in Los Angeles Unified. Um, Principal Mauro Bautista and Community Schools Coordinator and Restorative Justice uh, Coordinator um, Emily Grijalva, both of whom have previously joined us uh, in past years on the show, uh, Manuel, on different episodes. But today we're coming together like Voltron and we're going to go deep <laughs> around one of the more exciting aspects of the work they do at their school, which is a community schools model. Um, and their high school serving the Boyle Heights and, and east um, side of L.A. communities uh, is opening what will become uh, one of the district's largest wellness centers um, and is a school that has done a tremendous amount of work over the years to leverage community partners, to provide a whole host of wraparound support services to students and families in service of the, you know, the many needs in, in the community. So uh, we're gonna get deep on this topic of community schools, what community schools are, what it means, um, and perhaps get some pearls of wisdom from them uh, for folks who might be thinking about how to bring a community schools approach uh, to their district, their school site across the country. So it's gonna be an interesting conversation. You definitely don't wanna miss it. As usual, that sounds dope, Jeff. But I gotta ask, I gotta ask. Our AOTA family, those who watch the show and listen to the show, um, wide range of folks, wide range of folks across the country, really. And there might be someone listening who maybe they're an elementary teacher or something like that. And maybe they're at a school site in a community that is very well resourced. Maybe they're at a school site that doesn't need to have any kind of wraparound services because the children that they, that they serve come from families with um, great amounts of wealth and they have their needs taken care of. So why should someone in that situation listen in on today's interview today's seminar uh, about yeah. community schools yeah well i so i have both a uh, inspirational and a cynical uh <laughs> answer to that question bad well the inspirational answer is because we as a society have chosen to uh support many of the kind of efforts to create equal opportunity in our society. We're America, we love the phrase equal opportunity, and we have centered a great many of the systems, practices, efforts that we use to say this is the land of opportunity in our schools. And in my mind, the community schools model is probably the most robust, most comprehensive approach to really trying to create this, this core community institution that provides equal opportunity to all. So if you, if you believe in freedom, if you love the idea of equal opportunity in the society, this is gonna be an interesting conversation for you to be a part of. Now, the other side of the coin, the more cynical take on that is, we have piled all these responsibilities on our schools to deal with the great inequities that we have placed um, you know, in certain communities. We've concentrated in certain communities and we've said to our schools, hey, you know, uh, provide a great education, poverty doesn't matter, do it. And I think the great promise that the community schools approach offers us is the idea that actually schools can't do all this work alone, that actually there is a broad, comprehensive, systemic approach that's required in order to be able to help meet the foundational needs that kids and families and communities have so that we can help unlock the potential of a high quality public education that's free and accessible to all. So regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, you're gonna to wanna to be a part of today's conversation. Woo, y'all heard the man. You don't wanna miss out on today's seminar. But up first we have our Do Now where we're gonna talk about some news and headlines around the world of education. Stay tuned. All right folks, now it's time for today's Do Now. Jeff. How are we going to do the do now today? Well, man, well, we uh, started the episode talking about it's November and there being some elevated stakes uh, in school around, you know, uh, first semester grades coming up and college applications. So what would be more fitting, man, well, for this moment than to issue a report card? We got some grades for you today. Some grades. All right. Let's see. Let's see. You know, grades are particularly important around this time of year for certain students um, because, you know, sometimes your 
ability to enjoy your Thanksgiving break or mm. Your, mm. your winter break sometimes is contingent on what that report card was looking like. So Jeff, our first grade for today's Do Now is actually, actually an A. Love it, love it. I'm feeling like, yes. About to, about to get that new, you know, Xbox game for Christmas or, you know, about to get some some reward uh, at home. Um, feeling good about my performance, Manuel. All right. It's really about the learning, Jeff. It's not about that Xbox game or, or whatever. It's really about the learning. Uh, exactly. Yes. That's, but in any case, yes. yes, today's A is for accountability. Mm. In this case, in this case, a district in California is being held accountable for its decision. It's very uh, partisan decision to ban critical race theory. Yes, here in the great liberal wonderland of California. All right, so let's get into it. This story comes to us by way of EdSource, thanks to some reporting by Diana Lambert. And she reports that California State University Fullerton has halted placement of student teachers in Placentia Yorba Linda Unified School District, in part due to the district deciding to ban the teaching of critical race theory. A statement from the university read, in part, quote, the placement of student teachers in Placentia your Belinda Unified School District at this time would place us in conflict with our goals to prepare teacher candidates with pedagogical approaches rooted in diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, race and gender theories, cultural linguistic studies, social emotional well-being, and tenets of critical race theory. Now, the university had already started to scale back placements in the fall of 2022 after feedback from student teachers who said mentor teachers couldn't tell them whether they were allowed to teach curriculum related to ethnic and cultural differences. These are areas aligned with state standards for teacher preparation. A lack of clarity around what can be taught in the district, the school board's resolution last April to ban critical race theory and ongoing uncertainty as to whether ethnic studies can be taught in the district led the College of Education to pause placements for the rest of this school year. The university typically places 70 to 80 student teachers in this district. At the time of the announcement, that number had already been reduced to just six. So Jeff, the school board, they voted no critical race theory in our district and their local university said, well, all right, enough is enough. No more student teachers for you. Jeff, what's your reaction here? What are your thoughts about this? Uh, my first gut reaction, Manuel, was like, shoot, maybe I need to start paying more attention to what's going down with the, uh, the student teacher uh, coming out of Cal State Fullerton, man, because uh, I love this, yep. uh, frankly. Now, I, I can imagine that in their immediate context and for them, there are more administrative logistical concerns at play that might outweigh the sort of larger political uh, discussion here. But from, from my sort of outside vantage point, I haven't worked with too many educators who came out of their program. Um, I work with a lot of folks, uh, I guess, more in sort of the central LA rooted institutions. Right. So like UCLA, USC, Cal State LA, uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills, and Cal State uh, Northridge. Uh, so I'm like, huh, maybe I need to see what's cracking out in Orange County with, uh, with Cal State Fullerton, man, because uh, I, so I think it is a principled stance rooted in like a real uh, problem that these districts are creating for themselves, which is uh, fundamentally rooted in the hypocrisy and the lies and the manipulation of these so-called, you know, efforts to prevent CRT. That what these actually are is like efforts at psychological warfare against kids and educators and presents educators with lots of impossible choices. Like, how can I both teach an honest history and not talk about controversial topics or not talk about how the United States has an overwhelming record of, of history of uh, both legal and extra legal, you know, racism, sexism, colonialism, you know, exploitation of labor, etc. Like these are just core elements of our nation's history and how we came to be the country that we are today. So to not teach about them is to lie. Uh, to the students to say that these things can't be taught places teachers in the position of not being able to fulfill even the potentially unsatisfying mandates that come in most state standards around just the basic teaching of history. And so I love that they, you know, that they issued this kind of ultimatum and withdrew their uh, their 
teacher candidates uh, from this district. And Manuel, I particularly love it because I am sure their, their district may not be suffering to the same extent that other districts are. I don't know. But we are all existing in an environment where there is a teacher shortage. And so to remove student yeah, yeah. teacher candidates, you know, if a couple of years ago they had 60 or 70 candidates placed in their district, you can bet that the majority of those folks wound up seeking positions in their district. And so this is going to be a potential uh, cutoff of a major pipeline. It's not like there's just universities everywhere churning out teacher candidates, right? Yeah, like if one yeah. of the major state universities cuts off their pipeline to you in this way, you're at a significant disadvantage in terms of hiring. And maybe this is a lever that we can pull to, to have some consequence for these districts that are doing this hateful, racist, evil policies. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. I, I love that the way you put it right there. Perhaps this is a lever we could pull. I think this shows that, you know, as we scramble to figure out how do we respond to these these ongoing attacks on our curriculum and, and these bills coming across all over the place, even here in California, of course, this is a board resolution, a local school board resolution, um, not, not something coming out of the legislature. But as we scramble to figure out what's the right response, boom, here we go. Here's a lever that, that can work in a lot of places. If a school district is not allowing its teachers to use, utilize tenets of critical race theory or anything that might be construed as critical race theory, then as a university, why would you want to place student teachers there? Why would you want your student teachers to have to tiptoe around some basics of, of their teacher preparation and, and not really know what they can say or can't say or what they can teach and can't teach? Why would you even want to do that? Go ahead and pull them and let's hold this district accountable and, and districts like it accountable. The A stands for accountable for our grade. It could also stand for as they should, because that's what my mother-in-law says. Every time someone does something they're supposed to do, oh, um, they pull their student teachers from that district, as they should, because there are yeah. there definitely are consequences and repercussions for these decisions that are being made that are partisan and political, especially ones made by school board members that might not actually have much expertise in the education system, uh, but who are perhaps um, elected to elected to the school board for partisan reasons. Now, being that we're in California and the state has recently passed a bill to require ethnic studies, this is one of those uh, sticking points right here where we're gonna see what these more um, red-leaning, right-leaning districts are gonna do as the state mandate comes out because the mandate is ethnic studies is a graduation requirement. And if you have school boards out there saying, okay, fine, we'll do that, but no critical race theory, then you're gonna have other school boards out there, I'm sure, trying to um, design or, or, or approve a, uh, some version of ethnic studies that's not ethnic studies at all. And Cal State Fullerton looks to be one of the first cases of holding those districts accountable and pulling their student teachers. I'm looking for the University of California system to hopefully follow suit. And there's discussion about uh, admission requirement for the UCs to be a course in ethnic studies. So that's another level lever that can be pulled. If you want your students to be elevated or accepted into UCLA and UC Berkeley and UC Riverside and these other places, they better have had some expertise or some background, some, some learning in ethnic studies, including some of the tenets of critical race theory. Otherwise, we ain't going to accept them. So yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love it, man. I hadn't even been thinking like this, the system wide uh, implications um, across the state, man, well, of this. Uh, but I, I love that. And I wonder, you know, the politics in California certainly uh, might make what you just proposed more viable than it would be in other states. But I do wonder about the applicability of this, particularly in lots of states, um, you know, in parts of the country where, you know, there's a more even split between the partisan lines, right? So places like, you know, uh, Illinois or Wisconsin or Michigan or, you know, some, some of these kind of places where like these sorts of policies where we have seen real vitriol coming out of, you know, school board meetings and very draconian swings to these, you know, these Nazi-like policies of banning books and these sorts of, uh, you know, uh, banning ideas and banning making white kids uncomfortable or these sorts of things, right? Like maybe this is a very serious lever that can be pulled to say like, we can't stop you from passing these laws, but what we can do is say, we are not gonna support the implementation of these laws that are morally wrong and institutionalizing lies to our children uh, with you know, the, the support of the, of the state universities. So fascinating, fascinating uh, potential here. Yeah, absolutely. And just imagine, I know this won't happen, but ju just imagine if you know someone like the college board 
stepped in and say, you know what, we want to make sure that uh, our AP courses have some of this and have some of that. And if you're, mm. if you have one of these anti-truth, anti-human bills in your state, that that's going to be in violation. Imagine just how many organizations out there have the power to step in and say, okay, fine. If this is the direction you're going in your public schools, just so you know, your students are not going to get these um, accolades, these these certifications, these whatever we have to offer because um, your stance is in contrast to our stance of uh, equity and diversity and inclusion and all these little things that they throw out there in their corporate statements. So just saying, man, just saying there's levers that can be pulled. And now is the time. Yeah. It's been time to go ahead and um, force that issue. Yeah, you're even making me think, man, well, about like the accreditation process that Boom, districts that too. And, and states have to go through, right? Like if you're going to if you're going to overtly lie to your students and teach a false historical narrative or teach a, you know, an intentionally racist and biased curriculum, then you you can't be accredited, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, th this is uh, opening up a whole new lane of possibilities here. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right, Jeff, that was the first grade. That was an A for accountability. I love it. I love it. What do we got next? What do we got next? Well, man, well, the next grade is uh, maybe not as glorious as an, as an A, but it's, you know, it's the good old college try. It's a solid C. Mm. Is it C for critical race theory, Jeff? I don't know. I think we've hit our limit of critical race theory for one episode before <laughs> all the trolls race, jump in. Critical race theory. Uh, <laughs> It probably should be a C for CRT. Uh, no, man. Well, it is actually a C, as in C. I told you so. Ah, that's <laughs> that's a trick, Jeff. That was a trick question. Yes. Yeah. You see, see what I did there? Yeah. Okay. Indeed. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. So here's here's the story behind the C. I told you so. Educators across the country know that, of course, learning loss is the main story of education, the only thing we should be paying attention to. And of course, lazy educators are to blame for the learning loss, and especially the lazy educators who shut down the schools for a year or more because they are the kings and queens of learning loss, right? Everyone knows that that is the, the narrative, correct? Yeah, obviously, uh, obviously. <laughs> obviously, uh, except there's a emerging body of research that tells us something uh, potentially quite different, Manuel. So we're gonna get into this here. This story comes to us uh, by uh, Kaylin Belsha. I hope I'm saying that person's name correctly, uh, out of Chalkbeat. Um, and using the latest national and state test score data, a team of researchers writing at educationrecoveryscorecard.org found that districts that stayed remote during the 2021 school year did see bigger declines in elementary and middle school math and to some degree in reading than other districts in their state. But the losses varied widely, and many districts that went back in person had bigger losses than districts that stayed remote. The pattern is inconsistent enough that school closures, it seems, were not the primary driver, driver of those drops in achievement. Quote, based on the discussion before these results came out, you'd think that the only thing driving achievement losses would be remote learning. But actually, that does not seem to be the case, said Thomas Kane, a Harvard professor of education and economics who co-led this research. I was really surprised by these results, he said. The team relied on testing data from 29 states spanning around 4,000 school districts that serve some 12 million students in third to eighth grades, or around half of the U.S. student population for those age groups. The research team also found that high poverty districts suffered greater academic losses, offering a more sobering picture than the National uh, uh, Assessment of Educational Pro Progress, excuse me, the NAEP results did and echoing some earlier pandemic research. The differences in lost learning between low and high poverty districts weren't large, but were noteworthy, particularly in math. The trend held for reading as well, though the differences were smaller. So Manuel, um, uh, we like we started this uh, this segment with. We know the cause of all the learning loss. It's it's obviously the the lazy educators. Uh, so this data is maybe telling us something different. But um, how can we still find a way to blame this on the lazy educators, Manuel? 
Well, you know, I'm sure whoever collected this data was themselves an educator or someone on the woke woke left who's trying to pass this fake news, thinking these numbers and statistics, thinking science is going to prove their point. We know better than to trust numbers and data, Jeff. Mm, but yes. Yeah. No, in all seriousness, obviously, uh, like, see, we, we told you so. Like, there are so many people saying it's just waiting, just waiting for test scores to come out so they could be like, look, 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 y'all closed the schools and look what it did, look what it did. Um, first of all, schools were never closed. Of course, the physical campuses were um, because it was a pandemic. Um, but yeah, there's people waiting and waiting for scores to come out. And as soon as scores start coming out, they're like, we told, we told you, we told you, uh, closing the schools, look, look what you've done, look what you've done. And here we have research that supports the fact that actually there's not a correlation between which schools stuck with distance learning and which schools opened up their school doors uh, during the pandemic. Uh, test scores are, are not looking good, generally speaking, because it was a pandemic. Globally, millions of people died globally. We faced something that no one in our lifetime has had to face before, at least in this kind of way. So of course, of course, test scores are showing some, um, some dips based on what all we have experienced here. It would be miraculous. It would be a miracle if test scores didn't drop during this time. So it should be expected that they were gonna drop and it's definitely not the fault of those uh, schools and school districts that decided to stick with distance learning into the 2020, 2021 school year. So all that being said, I'm, I'm sure there's someone listening to this show or watching this show, perhaps um, in a state where you know, things were a little more more divided in terms of if the school should open or not. I know here in California, most districts pretty comfortably stuck with distance learning and, and didn't face too much outright pressure. I know my district, we you know, we didn't face too much outright pressure to open up the school doors. Um, our families wanted to keep their children home during this pandemic. But in any case, there's someone listening or someone watching who perhaps was in an area where they were facing real pressure to open their classrooms up and they stuck with it. With the distance learning, they stuck with what they knew was best, which was keeping people safe. And they've probably been questioning themselves ever since. And I think this research here um, can help reassure those of you who had to make that difficult decision to continue with distance learning. This can help reassure you that that decision did not hamper or add to or exacerbate learning loss. And in fact, you probably ended up saving some lives in some kind of way in making that decision to do that. Now, Jeff, I. You know, teaching at my high school, our scores came out recently and I had no interest in looking at the scores because I know any testing during around the pandemic, testing period is, is already problematic enough, but during and around the pandemic, yeah, forget about it. I had no interest in knowing what our scores look like, whether they went up or down, despite all these headlines about learning loss and, and test scores going down. But in researching the previous story that we just talked about, the Fullerton one, EdSource had a little pop-up that was like, look up your score, look up your scores, um, because the scores had just been made made public. So um, that pop-up's not there today. So hopefully it was just, a, hopefully they decide, you know what, let's not throw this in people's face. But I typed in my score, I looked up our scores, and for whatever reason, our English scores actually went up between 2019 and 2022. I don't really know why, that's fine, but you know. We don't need to look at that data because we just survived a pandemic. We need to come back together, heal, and figure out the best way forward and not be over here just like raging about learning loss. So there's that. Yeah. Yeah. So, man, well, I, so I really appreciate every, everything you said there. And I think there's like a few wrinkles in the data that it probably does make sense for us to name here mm -hmm. uh, just to just to like be be as transparent i guess as we can be right so for example what the the kind of comparison that you just made right looking up your school and of course you work at a high school and right. here in california as in some other places across the country as well high schoolers only take their state standardized test score in the 11th grade so comparing the 11th graders from 2019 to the 11th graders from june of 2022 is not the same group of kids, right? So there are in some discussions of this data, apples to oranges comparisons being made and saying like, oh, we, we went up, oh, we went down. There is some you know, reason to look at the data that way because even though it's a different group of kids, it does still also you know, in some way speak to the collective work that is done with the students that you have had for three years um, at this point. And, even if you say, okay, well, let's control for that, uh, for that data a little bit better and have an apples to apples comparison. Let's look at our 11th graders 
in June of 2022. Let's look at their eighth grade scores from, you know, three years ago. Uh, even in that case, there's still lots of var variables in the equation that make that a tough comparison precisely because of the effects of the pandemic, right? right. So there's just, it's a very complex picture to try to unpack statistically speaking. Um, now, these researchers and many others are, are both looking at state test scores and looking at the NAEP scores. Um, they're not exactly, you know, it's not the same assessment. They're not necessarily assessing the same grades of kids and not using the same methods of assessment, uh, but does offer us some, you know, holistic picture. And I think an important takeaway from this to note, Manuel, is that the data is complex enough to, to tell us to pause on the broad sweeping generalizations that say, oh, because we went to remote learning, therefore learning dipped across the board, right? Um, or, you know, because uh, teachers were ineffective at remote learning teaching, therefore, you know, learning loss happened, right? Like the picture is much more uh, nuanced than that. And I think it's, it is both important that we recognize that and acknowledge that and start to shift some of our discourse around this topic. And also for us to say, and, and I got to give credit to um, Jose Wilson, who uh, I saw tweeted something about this this, uh, this morning. This is uh, uh, October 28th, if, <laughs> or what is it, 28th, 29th? Man, it's sometime some, at the end of October. Knows? I don't know when you were going to be watching or listening to this episode, but um, as of the morning of filming, he tweeted this out, um, you know, an article talking about this issue and saying, like, where's the apology coming to the educators who've, you know, fought hard to protect students and families by staying, by moving to or staying in remote learning during some of the more um, horrific moments of the pandemic where transmission was high, where we perhaps didn't yet have vaccines and people were literally getting desperately ill and dying. Um, and, and of course that apology is not coming uh, to educators. Of course the credit is not coming to educators, to unions, to community activists who said, you know what, maybe what we need to do is go to remote learning right now, despite the fact that everyone knows that remote learning in aggregate was nowhere near as good as in-person instruction. We don't think the risk of sickness and death outweighs the, you know, these short-term immediate benefits, man. So, um, I, you know, I'm glad that this more nuanced picture of the data is coming out. And I think there's probably a few more layers of nuance we need to unpack to actually try to understand what happened and sort of make sense of it. And maybe this should inform us as we move forward and potentially face other threats like this in the future. Yeah, right there, right there for sure. And that nuance, that, that reason to, to pause and avoid sweeping conclusions and accusations, I'm not sure we live in a society that's real big on that stuff <laughs> these days, Jeff, but you are correct. You are correct. And again, to anybody out there who is a education leader in your area and who, if you made the difficult choice to continue or to go to ro remote learning or continue remote learning and you're, you're really beat up about it, here's, here's some data that suggests and that shows that this remote learning did not necessarily contribute to the quote unquote learning loss that we are seeing so many headlines about. So yeah, much more to unpack. And I'm sure it will take, honestly, it's going to, it's going to take years. It's going to take a very long time to fully understand truly the impact that the pandemic and pandemic pedagogy has had on, on our young ones for sure. So we'll get there. All right, folks, that's it for today's do now. Took a look at some headlines around the world of education, including bans on critical race theory, Districts held accountable for that and um, new data around so-called learning loss amid the pandemic. So stick up, uh, stick up, stick, stick with us, stick with us for our next segment, um, our seminar where we will discuss this concept of community schooling. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. Hey folks, thanks so much for tuning in to All The Above. We really appreciate you. And as you know, All The Above is a small operation. It's just me and just Manuel, that's it. We have no sponsorships, which means we are totally dependent on our amazing audience to help support the show. So here's what you can do. Go to our website, which is aotashow.com support. That's aotashow.com support. 
There you can find links to everything you can do to support the show. You find all the links to every platform that we're on where you can like, subscribe, follow, make sure you share our show with your whole network. Also, you can donate there. We are on Venmo, we're on Cash App, and most importantly, you can find the link to our Anchor page where you can become a monthly patron. Even a small donation once a month will make a huge difference in helping us continue to produce the show. Lastly, you can find there the link to get your flyest, best, latest, all the above show merch. Okay, all you gotta do is go to aotashow.com slash support. Thanks, enjoy the rest of the show. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. Thanks so much for joining us. And we are super excited to have you here with us for a conversation that I think is going to be fascinating. Um, now, I have to say on the front end, uh, in the beginning of the episode, we mentioned we were gonna have double dopeness in the building today, two amazing guests. Unfortunately, one of our guests is unable to join us today, uh, but no fear, because we have the incredible, the wonderful, Emily Grijalva, Community Schools Coordinator from Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School in Boyle Heights here in Los Angeles, who is with us today, who's going to bring all the knowledge, all the amazing uh, skills and talents to the table for our conversation. Uh, so Emily, welcome back to All the Above. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, okay, folks, let me tell you a little bit more about today's wonderful guest. Um, Emily Grijalva is the Community School Coordinator and sponsor of the GSA at Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School in Los Angeles. She taught English for 12 years, where her pedagogy was rooted in social justice and love. Emily received the United Way's Inspirational Teacher Award, Award in 2014, was recognized in 2016 by the Obama administration's White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, and won the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools Courageous Teacher Award in 2017. She's earned her master's degree from UCLA and is currently pursuing her PhD at Claremont Graduate University with a focus on equity in K-12 education. Um, Emily, thanks so much for joining us again, and I'm gonna kick it over to Manuel for our first question. Yeah, community dopeness in the building. Emily, thank you so much for taking time out to be here with us again on all of the above. Uh, we very much appreciate you taking time out to be here. And we're here to talk about community schools and community schools, that's one of those terms that gets used a lot in education, especially nowadays. Um, but oftentimes it's um, pretty misunderstood or people use it in different ways and have different understandings or definitions of what a community school even is. So how about we start by um, having you explain a little bit about within your context, um, what is a community school and why is that important? Yeah, thank you um, for having me once more. I love talking about community schools. Um, I also want to start off by acknowledging first that really the community school um, model is not something new. It's something that's been used constantly in social justice movements, right? When you think about the Black Panthers with the freedom schools, free breakfast programs and clinics, when you think of the Zapatistas and their caracoles, um, and a lot of indigenous um communities have had this idea, right? Where it's really about that the community knows what's best for the community and they're wanting to provide it by supporting the youth in the community and their families. Um, and then as far as Mendes High School in Bull Heights, right? We have a rich history of community organizing the Chicano walkouts, right? Where students knew exactly what they wanted in their education in the 60s. Um, and you have the East, the mothers of East LA organizing to stop a prison being built in Bull Heights and instead allotting resources to like schools and also being very um, involved in trying to stop gang violence without necessarily criminalizing youth. You have Father Boyle, Homeboy Industries, right? Where the idea that if we're able to provide jobs, services, resources, um, that's exactly what our community needs. And they don't need to be criminalized and they don't need to be disposed of. And a lot of that was creating, right, job services. Um, Dolores Mission, the church that he started, um, still to this day, um, house uh, immigrant men at, in the evening and provide all sorts of services. So I start off by seeing all those examples, right, because that's exactly what a community school, it is truly looking at 
what does the community already bring? What are already the resources, the resiliency, really tapping into all of that knowledge that the community already has and making sure that students, families can access it. And then if there is an actual need that maybe there isn't a resource in the community, we're going to go out and look for it and bring it in. But it's so important that it's not wraparound services. It's not coming in at a deficit or savior lens. It's really uplifting what the community already has, what the community wants and creating this kind of like seamless connection between school and community like they can't exist without the other mm. yeah appreciate that uh that context emily and uh especially connecting the current work around community schools which in some ways is uh, in, in a positive way you know now receiving more like state funding and you know is, has maybe become uh, a more like popular mainstream idea but comes out of a very sort of community organizing radical uh, protest movement history uh, which is which is really interesting to think about in terms of how you know the seeds planted from the past are you know are manifesting and maybe shifting some resources um, today. So very much appreciate that, and uh, want to ask you about your particular school because Mendez High School is preparing uh, to open. Uh, what will become, I believe, the district's uh, largest or perhaps one of the largest um, on-site wellness centers uh, for any school in Los Angeles Unified. Uh, the wellness center is uh, being named after um, Sylvia Mendez, who, of course, uh, is part of the namesake uh, of Mendez High School and was one of the, um, you know, maybe along with like Ruby Bridges, one of the great sort of child heroes of uh, the, the educational civil rights movement um, in our nation's history, history, helping to desegregate or lay the legal foundation for desegregation of, uh, of schools here in Southern California and across the country. Um, but wondering if you could tell us a bit about um, the, you know, kind of the work of creating the wellness center um, at your school and also the impacts that you're expecting to see from the wellness center on students, on families, on the community that, that Mendez High School serves. Yeah, we're really excited. And by the way, we're hoping that the grand opening will be in December. You're all invited. <laughs> um, it's been a lot of work in the making. We were talking about over a decade of <laughs> organizing and the whole process. Um, so to ask for a wellness center through the LAUSD district, right, to have one on site, it's not a very easy <laughs> process. Um, one, it requires showing that there is a need, right? And so that involved the community coming together, surveying, looking at the health, disparities in our community, looking at, um, you know, who uh, who has insurance, who doesn't, who has access to uh, medical services. And so really presenting that to the district as being like, hey, Bull Heights has a need. Our community has a need. We really want one. Then comes the whole process of do you have the space for it? Where do you want it? And so they originally came back to us and we're like, fine, you can have a wellness center, but we're going to build it in the elementary school nearby, which is Utah. And we were like, no, high school students are not going to want to go to their like an elementary school to ask for like, reproductive services or things like that. So then we had to go back and organize and again, have these like listening sessions, community meetings. And so they finally agreed to actually build it. And then came the whole construction, right? Groundbreaking, building it. And then the pandemic happened while it was building. So it totally lengthened the process. Um, you know, we feel like we are constantly having to change when the, um, the wellness center is going to open, but they finally finished construction. They handed the keys to St. John's, who is our uh, medical provider um, and who's been bringing a mobile clinic for years now at Mendez High School. Um, and so they're furnishing it, getting it ready. And so what we're going to have is access to medical doctors, um, an eye doctor, dentist, and therapy. Um, so we're really excited. And the way that it's built, right, there's a public entrance, so the community can make appointments and attend. And then there's a private school entrance for our students. So they'll be able to make appointments as well. They'll, they each have their own lobby for just student privacy. Um, and then also, I think it's really going to support um, our nurse. Our nurse is amazing, by the way. Shout out to Nurse Song, who's been in the front line, especially now during the pandemic. He is constantly seeing, seeing students. And we're very blessed that we've had a full-time nurse since the school opened, and it's been Nurse Song. And so he's going to get a chance to refer students to the Wellness Center Um 
the social worker and myself will refer to students for mental health needs. Um, and so we're really looking forward to students having access to, I mean, we all know, right, if they have a stomach ache, a headache, they need eyewear, um, they're maybe dealing with some traumatic events, if they don't get that support, it's really hard for them to focus on school. And so we're hoping to alleviate some of those stressors and provide those services to students and families. I love that. I love that picture you just painted of this wellness center. And I certainly would love to be there uh, when it opens up this December. Now, the school that I teach at, we we have a, well, a wellness center, but it's it's a bit smaller and it's uh, much more limited to uh, mental health and mental wellness um, services, um, as opposed to the, the one that you will be opening up this December. And, you know, I can't imagine anybody out there would have a problem with anything like this or arguments against anything like this because the need is so great, um, especially in our most marginalized communities. But there certainly are going to be folks who say, well, you know, the business of school is really teaching and learning. And it's already a problem that schools are expected to address or solve some of these issues in society, such as poverty, um, that have a, a lot less to do with actual teaching and learning. And some will say perhaps wellness centers and community schools just divert resources and divert attention from the core business of school, which is teaching and learning. So uh, what is what are your thoughts on, on those arguments that community schooling as a model um, diverts us from the focus of school, which is traditionally teaching and learning? Yeah, I think for a long time, right, we had that mentality that when the students walk in to the classroom door, all their, you know, emotional needs, physical needs are just kind of left at the door and we can just focus on reading, writing and math. Right. Um, but I know that there has been since then so many um, re uh, like research done around, you know, the tra how trauma impacts students ability to learn physical health impacts students ability to learn um, not having basic needs impacts students ability to learn. Um, and, you know, I think about a lot of um Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, right, and her work that she's been doing in the medical field around um, trauma informed practices. And, you know, as a doctor, she mentions how, you know, a lot of the times a kid comes in, has a stomach ache, doctor prescribes something, and okay, you're done, right? Like a quick band aid fix. But what if that child is afraid, right? And or is dealing with something or, you know, and, and you're just going to keep seeing that student, right? And so or that child. And so I think it's the same thing with schools, when you're trying to tackle attendance issues, when you're trying to tackle like, students not being engaged in schoolwork, right? A lot of those are deeply connected to larger needs. And so if the school does not you know, tackle the root of the problem or the root of the issue that might be keeping the child from learning, then we're going to continue to have students dropping out, missing school, not passing their classes, which then directly impacts what you said, right, where people want students to learn, want them to graduate, want them to move on and do well. Um, and I guess for folks that are, you know, obsessed over like data, right, if you really want to have optimal grades, optimal passing of tests, optimal attendance, then you need to be able to provide, you know, services for anything that might be causing it. So I feel like, you know, there's just, learning's not gonna happen, and I'm sorry, a motorcycle's passing by right now. Um, learning is not gonna happen, or it's, you know, not gonna happen in its full potential if you have certain needs that are not being met. And so I, I appreciate the move to be more trauma-informed, more community school-oriented, um, because I think that you see such great growth the minute that you're able to take away that obstacle that's keeping that child from learning. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that context, Emily. And uh, I, you know, I do wonder about the kind of importance uh, in the community schools approach of having the services at the school site. Um, because, you know, one, one might think that, you know, there are clinics, there are hospitals, there are doctor's offices, there are, you know, social workers, there's services, you know, in some cases down the street from a school. Uh, and so, you know, what really is the importance, or I'm wondering if you can speak to what the importance is of actually having a physical wellness center on a school site campus, um, and, you know, like why the investment in this kind of model um, is so important in your eyes and it's something that potentially we should think about expanding or, you know, maybe bringing to other uh, school sites as well. Yeah, 
first of all, accessibility is so important, right? So you're right. There may be a clinic down the street. There may be uh, a Planned Parenthood, you know, a few blocks away. Um, but it is hard for, I mean, I don't know if y'all remember when y'all were 14 or 15 to actually make an appointment and take yourself to these areas. Or sometimes they'd seem kind of scary, right? Like a little daunting. Um, I, we already know that a lot of our, at least in Bull Heights, our community, um, some of them are undocumented, um, Spanish speaking. Um, you know, we have a lot of newcomer students as well. So just telling them like, here's a number, make an appointment and go on your own. I mean, yes, they could, but chances are they might not, right? And so I think that if we're making it a little bit more accessible, it will be more likely that students will be seen and receive the services they need. Um, it also helps the parents who maybe are afraid to access some of the institutions because of their citizenship status to be able to know that the school offers this for their children and for them. Um, and then also just in general, we're also excited because we're thinking, okay, we have a wellness center. We can also use this to help with like career pathways. Maybe the students themselves can be health ambassadors. They can help, you know, um, we're actually going to offer next um, semester a medical terminology course. We're trying to think of like the CTE kind of pathways that can connect students to see themselves working and being a part of the wellness center. We already started a student advisory board with the Children's Trust where they're going to be doing a lot of the like pure advocacy and kind of health education work. So even that part is also another added bonus where students can also be, you know, connected to the wellness center beyond just the services, but then themselves as health and peer advocates. Um, and I think going back to your second question, um, Jeffrey, um, as, and something that I missed at the beginning too. So I kind of gave more like a historical layout, right? But community schools in LAUSD in particular, right, came out of the another organizing effort, the UTLA strike. Um, because of a lot of things that were, you know, we noticed that there was a lot of needs, right, that needed to be met. And when you were talking about either other issues too, like let's say, for example, stopping um, random searches, defunding school police, right? We know that when we're trying to do things restoratively and you're talking to students and figuring out why they might be disengaged, their resources, usually there's a need, right? There's a need that's not being met. And so a lot of those needs can be met through community school services. The LEUSD framework um, falls around four pillars. Um, they're the integrated student support, um, extended uh, enrichment and learning opportunities, um, family and community engagement. And the fourth one is collaborative leadership which is probably the most difficult one for a lot of schools. Um, and the reason that I say this, and I know I'm kind of shifting away from the wellness center. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and so those are the four pillars, right, of the at least the specific community school model that LUSD is choosing to follow and that a lot of schools across the nation are following. Um, so, you know, it makes sense to have integrated student support. So we have community organizations on site that do academic um case management, right, and really support students throughout the day. Um, extended learning, we're talking about, you know, after school, sports. Uh, one thing that I like to share is that Mendes is open until like seven o'clock at night and you'll have students hanging out, right? Like the idea of creating spaces where students can hang out and experience joy or get academic support, right? So all those after school activities, things like that. Family and community engagement, you know, is something that, uh, like I mentioned, right, we want to have our community partners, our community members coming in and out, that Mendes be a community hub. And we do, we host voting, we host like all these sort of different community events during the weekend and after school that impact the entire community that's open to everyone, not just our families. Um, and definitely, you know, parent engagement is always important, leading those parent workshops, inviting parents to also lead, you know, our parents have so much knowledge, so letting them lead their workshops. But going back to collaborative leadership. So this is the one that I even asked, like, why aren't all the schools applying to be like community schools? It's such a great program. You get a community school coordinator, you get some funds, you know, you get all these like this setup. Um, and so the other dope person that's missing, um, Principal Bautista and I were talking about this because he said that it's probably the collaborative leadership piece because principals then have to basically provide all the budgets and have local school leadership and all the stakeholders decide how budgets are run and you have more decisions being made from the community. So a principal has to be willing to give up 
the power, those, you know, certain power. And so a lot of principals struggle with that because that's not something that we're used to, right? A lot of the times decisions are made top down. And so to be like, I'm going to give that away and have, you know, different bodies at school make decisions. Um, you know, I can see how that would be hard, but at least for Mendes, it has really strengthened the different, like not just school site council, but also we have like a school culture team. We have the local school leadership council and we're making decisions that directly impact and it's teachers, parents, students, and admin, right? Um, and community partners. And so it definitely becomes a longer process, which is another thing that I think sometimes administrators are afraid that might happen, but it also means that decisions are being made more intentionally and we're making sure that we have everybody's input. And so I think that's a piece that is like, you know, kind of worthwhile investing in in the long run, because then you have so many people invested in the schoolwork. And then when you think about, let's say, principals leaving or staff leaving, um, the work is still sustainable because you have been having this process with various people in the community that will continue the work. All right. So that's super dope. We have folks in our AOTA family, uh, some who work in California, some who work in, um, in other states and other regions in the U.S. So what would you say to those educators out there or those listeners out there who want to get rolling on uh, tapping into the power of community schools in their own local context? What advice do you have or, or what words do you have for them? Yeah, so at this moment, there are so many funds available for community schools across the state and across the nation, right? Um, one of the cool things about being a community school coordinator, uh, at least in LA, they have a network. And so I meet with community school coordinators in North Carolina, in the Bay, and like all across the nation. So most likely you might have funds in your particular state for community schools, but there's definitely right now a whole community school initiative. So there's so many grants that you can apply. So I would say to one, research to see if maybe your state or city has you know, maybe a program already or like trying or has a grant particular to your area. If not, then I would start, you know, gathering folks, a team, right, um, to try to figure out how you can go ahead and start creating that process, right? And so one of the neat things about uh, community schools is that you there's always like surveying needs and assessment, right? What are the resources that our community needs, um, that our students need? And you can start off by maybe just asking the students, right? What do you need, right? Asking the staff and starting to see, are there resources or people you can tap in? But like I mentioned, it's definitely become a new, like very national um just I, I feel like there's just so many people that want community schools in their community. And I think the ideal goal is to make most schools across the nation community schools. So there's definitely grants and funding. It's just really making sure that your team knows what it is and that they're ready to do that kind of like initial groundwork. Um, and then, you know, you can get started, but there's so much support out there. Um, I know for LUSD, we're uh, tapping into the National Education Association, NEA. They have a whole curriculum, a framework, they offer us coaching. So there's definitely a lot of services that are nationwide that different um, districts can tap into to start that process. Uh, Emily, thank you so much for uh, for sharing some of your insights and wisdom today with um, with our audience. And we're going to link uh, below this episode some of the resources that Emily was referring to and some things that uh, folks who are perhaps interested in exploring what it might mean, what it might look like to bring community schools work or the community schools model to your school site. Um, we'll have those links uh, below this episode. So definitely uh, dive in there and check out uh, a little more information about this, folks. It's a lot of exciting work. Um, so uh, Emily Grijalva, Community Schools Coordinator at Mendez High School uh, in Boyle Heights, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, folks, that's it for today's seminar, uh, but stick around. Next up is our class dismissed. All right, folks. We have come to that point in the episode where we like to give shout outs to folks doing wonderful things in the world of education. We call this Class Dismissed. Jeff, what do we have for today? Well, man, well, today we got a, a little bit of a belated shout out to uh, one of the great events in high school athletics, one of the great events in like 
high school rivalry culture period across the country. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the greatest high school rivalry west of the Mississippi. I, you know, I don't know if that's exactly true or not, but it's pretty amazing. And for folks in LA, they probably know about it because it was covered on the news. Occasionally this gets covered on like Sports Center and that sort of thing. But um, in late October, the annual East LA Classic was, uh, was played. It is the biggest high school football rivalry in the city of LA, um, dating back decades and decades. Theodore Roosevelt High School versus Garfield High School. Uh, for folks who maybe are like, I'm not sure how to make a connection to that, uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt High School, legendary historic high school, one of the epicenters of the 1968 um, blowouts, um, huge amounts of uh, of Chicano and Latinx civil rights organizing emanating from that school over the decades. Garfield High School, home of the, uh, the great Jaime Escalante, um, you know, folks who maybe have seen the movie Stand and Deliver before, like this is the community that we're talking about, okay? Um, Boyle Heights versus East LA. And this year the classic was played at the LA Coliseum home football stadium for USC. Um, and it featured not only a great game, great competition, a lot of rivalry and friendly love in the, from the east side of LA, but also halftime show by Will I Am and the Black Eyed Peas. Will I Am grew up in Boyle Heights um, and really just showing up to give back to the community. The um, halftime show featured an amazing production of some of their hits, featuring the high school bands from both schools, featuring like Grammy level production. So they had the drones with the, that like, you know, spell out the logos and different words oh, in the sky. Like, yeah, it was pretty dope, man. So, um, so I just want to say a huge shout out to the Roosevelt High School community, Go Riders, even though unfortunately they lost this year. Uh, but shout out to all the, uh, the Rough Riders in the Roosevelt community. And of course, shout out to Garfield as well. Um, and a big shout out to Will I Am the Black Eyed Peas for showing up and, and really making an amazing experience for a whole set of young people um, to, you know, to have this just incredible moment um, and the stage as they so deserve. So um, big shout out to the East LA Classic 2022. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I can't let you say all that without pointing out the city of Pasadena and its rivalry, which is also historic between John Muir High School, which is where I teach. John Muir High School, we have such famous alums as Jackie Robinson and uh, Octavia Butler, MacArthur genius, and um, Rodney King and a whole bunch of other really historic folks. And our rival, Pasadena High School, home of General Patton. I, I believe he went there. They're pretty lame. John Muir High School, <laughs> John Muir High School for a very long time has been in charge of that rivalry, which is played in the Rose Bowl, home of the UCLA Bruins and um, home of a whole bunch of famous events in the past. Of course, this year did not go John Muir's way. It did not go John Muir's way. I blame the ongoing impacts of the pandemic and us just trying to, you know, just trying to get our footing right. But we'll be back next year. So shout out to all the Mustangs out there. And also shout out to the Pasadena High School Bulldogs or whatever. So yeah. All right, folks, that about does it. <laughs> <laughs> for this episode of All uh, the Above. We very much appreciate you hanging in there, especially those of y'all that hung in there all the way to the very end of this episode and are still with us here for these shout outs during our class dismissed. Very much love and appreciate you. We hope you take a moment to go ahead and give us that thumbs up or that five star. And if you're listened to this whole episode, please go ahead and check the links underneath uh, in the episode notes and head over to the YouTube video just to give a quick thumbs up because that helps us with the algorithms and all that for those um, who are out there who might discover us on YouTube. So. Very much appreciate y'all. Remember, AOTAShow.com for all the previous episodes and all that good stuff. All right, we'll see y'all next time.